I had the very simple idea that there had to be something else perturbing the way those fat molecules or lipid molecules move. And we uh, did a very unconventional experiment. We took these lipids from the lung, we put them in a bag and dialyzed them for several month, months in a bag in chloroform and methanol in the back of the laboratory. And finally, after removing all of the lipids, the, there were two small proteins that we now call surfactant protein B and surfactant protein C. These are very small, very lipid loving, and they had, were undiscoverable before that because you could boil them and they still worked, and you couldn't see them because they were hidden in the lipids. And we now know that these two proteins are absolutely critical for breathing throughout life. So we now know that surfactant is composed primarily 90% of lipids, and much of that is dipalmatylphosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylcholine. But during the last uh, 30 to 40 years, we identified, and others in, throughout the world have worked on these four proteins, surfactant proteins A, B, C, and D. And we now know from the fundamental work of, me of many uh, in the 1970s and 80s that surfactant replacement put back into the lungs of a preterm baby allows for rapid expansion, and that those surfactant preparations actually contain surfactant proteins B and C, and those proteins make the lipids spread instantaneously over the lung. So this is an MRI from a newborn premature sheep, and you can see the atelectasis and the fluid in the lung right after birth. By MRI in our intensive care unit, now we have an animal magnet and one right in the intensive care unit. So we can image the infant, a uh, full body image, without using radiation. And after giving surfactant, we now see full inflation, uh, the air uh, moving easily in ventilation. And we know from studies worldwide that surfactant replacement has markedly improved the outcome of babies, reducing both uh, RDS and death of preterm infants worldwide. These preparations, based on both bovine and porcine material contain surfactant proteins B and C. The work in our laboratory in Cincinnati with many of my coworkers, we used genetics and protein biochemistry to understand the function of, of all four of these proteins. Using gene knockout mice, uh, we were able to identify the roles of SPA and D, and these are antibacterial proteins. They regulate how much lipid is in your lung and the structure of that tubular myelin that allows for the, state, the steady state maintenance of surfactant in the lung. And they're critical for protecting the lung from viruses and bacteria. The two hydrophobic proteins, surfactant proteins B and C, are the speed proteins. These interact with the lipids, stabilize them, and allow the lipids to move instantaneously each time you take a deep breath. So we made antibodies in the 1980s against these proteins, and we used those in the earliest days of genetic cloning and cloned the genes encoding surfactant proteins B and C and A and D. And SPB, the very important protein, organizes the head groups of the lipids by interacting uh, with the hydrophobic face of an amphipathic helix. To understand what SPB did, we made gene knockout mice, and these are some of the first uh, gene knockout mice um, that we made back in the late 1980s and 90s, early 90s. And these mice, uh, wild-type mice seen here, are pink at birth, and the knockout mice, lacking any SPB, are just like preterm infants with hyaline membrane disease or RDS, and they can't breathe or inflate their lungs. But if we gave them a drop of surfactant, we could rescue them for a small amount of time. And if you're heterozygote for SPB, uh, you have uh, mild RDS and recover, and, uh, and yet you're susceptible to infection and injury if you're even missing one allele of SPB. So we need SPB at birth. There are no other abnormalities in the mice. During this time, one of my uh, previous fellows, Larry Noji, who's now at Johns Hopkins, identified the first patients who have full-term infants with cyanosis, grunting, retractions, who don't recover from normal intensive care unit, 
and die ultimately from respiratory distress because they have mutations in the human surfactant protein B gene. And the first patients have a 121 insert mutation that blocks the production of the mRNA and therefore no SPB protein. We made antibodies against both pro-SPB and SPB, and we can use those then for diagnosis of uh, infants or families who might have this severe lethal lung disease. And this shows the lung from the first babies with no staining for surfactant proteins B, the accumulation of A and abnormal pro-SPC in the lungs, and terrible interstitial lung disease and a disease called desquamating interstitial pneumonitis or chronic pneumonitis of infancy compared to here a normal lung showing where the staining of SPB and SPC uh, are. There are many mutations, perhaps now 25 mutations. It's usually lethal in the newborn period or uh, uh, by six months of age. They're unresponsive to surfactant because SPB um, is uh, required for the intracellular routing and processing of all the lipids and for the reduction of surface tension in the alveolus. It's an autosomal recessive inherited disease. There are distinct mutations. The 121 insert is the most common. They have respiratory distress, lack SPB and no lamellar bodies, and, and die of respiratory failure. Around the same time, we identified surfactant protein C, cloned the gene, identified the processing of the protein, which inserts into the lipids disrupting the packing of the lipids so allowing them to move rapidly. And this is the major uh, component, uh, one of the major components in surfactant. To understand what surfactant protein C did, we made a gene knockout mice. These are normal lungs, mouse lungs on this side, and these are surfactant protein C knockout mice. And they developed emphysema, interstitial inflammation, and ultimately fibrosis, and severe interstitial lung disease looking in some ways like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So working again with Larry Noji, uh, we identified the first children who have mutations in surfactant protein C. This is inherited as an autosomal dominant mutation, and the children often present in the first year of life with severe interstitial pneumonitis, inflammatory infiltrates, remodeling of the lung, pulmonary hypertension. And here you can see that there's staining of pro-SPC even there, though there's a mutation in the gene. And this is caused because the protein misfolds. This is the first genetic cause of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, even in adults. And it's caused by the misfolding of the precursor protein of SPC by mutations in the BICOS domain which are required for the normal intracellular trafficking. What happens with the mutation in pro-SPC is that norm, it escapes the ER quality control. In normal SPC, this is processed, packaged in the lamellar body, and secreted into the airspace. The misfolded protein accumulates in the lung, in a type two epithelial cells of the lung, this causes the accumulation of the protein that leads to apoptosis and cell death. And particularly these infants present in the first year of life when they have an influenza or respiratory syncytial virus infection. And they often uh, present with uh, respiratory failure in the PICU in the first year of life with the exacerbation caused by the viral infection which causes more misfolded proteins accumulating the protein causing cell death leading to interstitial lung disease. It's variably present uh, and penetrant within families. Uh, some children presenting even in the first days of life, some in the first year of life, and some not until uh, their teenage years. It's dominantly inherited, a chronic lung disease of infancy. These are folding mutations. They can cause ARDS and RDS, particularly with uh, intercurrent viral infections and they're the first genetic cause of interstitial lung, dis lung disease, or IPF. These two mutations account for approximately 30% of infants that present with unexplained respiratory failure as full-term infants 
with all the signs and features of premature lungs, but they're term babies. And so we were looking for the other causes, uh, other genetic causes that might explain this syndrome. And this led to collaborative work between Dr. Noji, our laboratories, and Michael Dean at the National Institutes of Health. There's a protein um, called ABCA3. It's a large protein, transmembrane protein. And yeast was known to transport lipids, and particularly phosphatidylcholine, which is the substance in our surfactant. And we considered that mutations in this gene might be a cause of, of abnormal lung function in the babies. And this led to the making of antibodies and the cloning of ABCA3. It's a large transmembrane uh, ATP-dependent transporter. It's very similar in structure to the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulatory protein. And unfortunately, there are many, many mutations throughout the protein and they're very difficult to diagnose because uh, there are no sim simple, easily diagnosed mutation. This is the most common genetic cause of this syndrome of a full-term baby with respiratory distress and accounts for another 40 to 50% of those infants. So together we now know the cause of, genetic cause of approximately 70 to 80% of full-term infants with unexplained respiratory failure. This is an x-ray of one of those children's from Cincinnati and show, shows the opacity of uh, severe alveolar disease uh, caused by ABCA3 deficiency. The pathology is variable depending on the age of the children. This is the normal lung, and these are infants at various ages, and different pathological diagnoses that are all caused by mutations in ABCA3. Because it's so difficult to make the diagnosis genetically, one has to either sequence the entire cDNA or gene, but one can look at the electron micrograph of these patients and, and help make the diagnosis. This is an electron micrograph of a normal lung with the lamellar bodies and a type 2 epithelial cell. And these are the abnormal, dense, small inclusions and lack of lamellar bodies in patients with ABCA3 mutations. And so families that have this disorder, if one has pathological tissue, uh, one can make the diagnosis by uh, looking at the electron micrograph. So ABCA3-related disease uh, is related to mutations that encode a lipid transporter. It's required for movement of the lipids into the lamellar bodies. It's autosomal recessive, full-term infant with ref uh, refractory RDS and abnormal surfactant lipids lack of lamellar bodies, there are multiple mutations, and for all of these disorders, genetic diagnosis and genetic counseling is now possible to help families with this very difficult disease. Well, we